I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. You must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Hi, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Nadir Talib Zadeh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. This is my first program on the show. It will be with uh, Dr. Jeremy Salt. Jeremy Salt uh, is an associate professor of Middle Eastern history and politics at Bill Kent University in Ankara. Uh, he's also the author of several books, including Imperialism, Evangelism, and the Ottoman Empire, and The Unmaking of the Middle East, uh, printed in the University of California. We'll be also talking to Jeremy about several of his recent articles, one controversial one called The Joke of the Century, talking about the deal of the century of Trump. Uh, he goes on and talks about Yemen, uh, the situation in Israel, uh, with an article entitled, uh, Does Israel Have a Death Wish? Um, we'll be talking about Syria, and you'll be talking about uh, uh, the hypocrisy of the West and the way it, it has reflected Syria and uh, the, the fake news that has been coming out of Syria. And I'll be talking about why he left Australia to teach in Turkey and what the reception has been among the students. So I hope you enjoy the show. He was a journalist for many years before studying and completing his PhD. He taught Middle Eastern history and politics in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Melbourne and later moved to the Department of Politics, where he also taught Middle Eastern Studies. In the late 1980s he moved to Istanbul and taught for a year at Bosphorus University before moving to the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at Bilkin University in Ankara, there. He taught courses on the modern Middle East, on Turkey's place in the Muslim world and on propaganda, media and politics. Intermittently, he returned to Australia to teach at the University of Melbourne. He has published articles in numerous journals, including the Muslim World, Journal of Palestine Studies, Middle Eastern Studies, Third World Quarterly, Current History, and Middle East Policy. He has a strong interest in late Ottoman history. His first book, Imperialism, Evangelism and the Ottoman Armenians 1878-1896 was published in 1993. Later this year the University of Utah Press will be publishing The Last Ottoman Wars. The Human Cost 1878-1923. In 2008 the University of California Press published his study of the modern Middle East, since the 19th century, then unmaking of the Middle East. A history of Western disorder in Arab lands. He is a frequent contributor to online journals, especially Palestine Chronicle and the American Herald Tribune. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Nadir. Okay, great. Uh, where are you? Are you in Australia or in Turkey? I'm in Turkey. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start off. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on our first show, uh, Dr. Salt. And uh, I, I want to start off by asking, why did you come all the way from Australia to Turkey to teach? What attracted you to this region right now? I've always been interested in this region. I first came to the Middle East when I was 21 or 22, a boy from Australia. I didn't want to go to London because everyone in Australia went to London. 
uh, I wanted to go somewhere different. And I was with a very good friend of mine, and he, it was his idea, let's go to Lebanon. And I had actually not much of an idea where Lebanon was or what it was. But that's where we ended up with little money, uh, but young and hopeful and uh, not kind of worried at all about whatever traps we might fall into. So that began my relationship with the Middle East. Uh, okay, I'm going to pursue my, my next question is we, we're about the same age. So I'm going to ask you about how... You're, young, you're much younger than me. It's very kind of you to say so. But I can see that I'm the older one. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, when I speak to younger people, there are certain questions that come to my mind. But when I speak to older uh, gentlemen and um, colleagues, the world has definitely changed. And there are those who are into illuminating others. I've, I've been reading your articles, uh, illuminating the situation in Syria. <clears throat> Uh, about um, what's going on with propaganda, the Western propaganda, about the state of things. Um, wh when, when was the, the shift where everything became, uh, where, where the, the, the lies of the media began? Where was the fault line where, in the recent decades, would you say, was the beginning of where, when everything started going haywire? I think that there's always where the I taught a course. I taught a course on propaganda um, at my university in Turkey, and the relationship between propaganda and the media and politics. And uh, in my as long as I can remember, the Middle East has always been a propaganda story, going back to the first time I went to Beirut in the 1960s. Right. So it's I would say the difference is that it's simply got a lot worse. All right. It's much cruder and more open than it was ever. Um, I'm not quite sure what would account for that. It might be technology, there's more of it. But the way that the mass media has reported in the Middle East largely can't be described as proper reporting. It's fundamentally propaganda. Uh, when you when you read the writing of people who are, who are on the ground and you compare that to what the media is reporting, there's such a gap that the two parts really can't meet. Um, and of course, our, the, at the heart of all of this, particularly where Palestine is concerned, of, of course, is Israel, right? It's the, the growing power. I mean, there was not much of an Israeli lobby back in the 1940s or 1950s, but it's grown to phenomenal strength in the last 20 or 30 years. And so in America in particular, it's very difficult to move or to speak without putting yourself at risk if you criticize Israel. I think this is all part of it. You have a very interesting article about Israel, and um, it goes like that. You you point to the fact that uh, Israel is nailing its own coffin, and uh, the title is "Does Israel Have a Death Wish?" Um, many of us here in, in in Iran also look at the way it's handling things as if it's going towards a fatal suicide. Why don't you comment on that? Well, the thing is that that's not the way the Israelis see it, of course. Um, they're, they're very, very confident that they can handle whatever problems come up. But um, if you look at the situation as it developed over the last 30 or 40 years, particularly since 1967, Israel has had many, many opportunities to make a peace in the Middle East, to make peace with the Palestinians. The offers have come from the Palestinians. The offers have come from Arab states. Every single one has either been ignored or dismissed out of hand. Now, from my point of view, being prudent, I, I would think, well, the Israelis had nothing. They took the lot. So you should be getting out while you're well ahead. But they don't do that. They want the whole thing. They want everything. And um, I think if you actually look at Israel's military performance since the 1970s, it's, it's just kind of been a steady downhill slide. It's not the state that it was in 1967. Like its enemies have learnt. Its enemies are arming themselves. Um, I, Hezbollah now is very threatening to Israel. I, I think if Israel starts another war, at the very least, it will be seriously damaged by Hezbollah to an extent it has never experienced before. Uh, so there are many elements in this picture. But for me, why don't the Israelis see it like this? Uh, you know, why don't they see that we we had nothing? We've got so much already. Why don't we? Why so? Why don't they make a genuine peace? What is it? What, why do they go for broke? Why do they want everything? Uh, there's something very strange about it, in my mind. 
what, what, what is your analysis of that? I mean, why, why is that obsession that they have of not relenting to anything logical or giving any credit to the original people of Palestine? Well, the thing is, well, because it doesn't belong to the original, they're the original people of Palestine, right? In their view, this, belong, this belongs to us, you know, and we don't have to give away what, what is ours. It belongs to us. And I think it's very interesting that in the, this deal of the century put forward by Jared Kushner, it's completely mechanical. It's all about money, right? There's no apparent understanding by Jared Kushner that Palestine actually is the property of someone else. It was taken from them in 1948. He doesn't think like that. Because he's Jewish, because he's a Zionist, Palestine belongs to the Jewish people. Uh -huh. And so there's no kind of consciousness of Palestinian history, Palestinian ownership, uh, no consciousness of the tremendous crimes that have been committed over the past 70 years. All of this is absent from his thinking. It just becomes a mechanical deal that we will offer the Palestinians this much money, they'll accept it, and that'll be the end of it. And it's not going to work like that, not in my view, yeah. You've done a lot of work and you've been uh, contributing a lot about Syria. Uh, first of all, before I, before I begin, I would like to ask you, is it frustrating as an academic and a journalist, and I think as an activist, uh, the way the West, uh, the Western propaganda media has taken over the scene, how hopeful are you that uh, the illuminated will, inc will increase in the, in, in the Western world? Well, uh, yeah, it's, it is, of course, very frustrating because, first of all, from, for someone like me, it can be very hard to get published. Right? I used to get occasional piece published in the Australian media, but on a variety of subjects, I would then submit articles which were never acknowledged. I mean, they wouldn't write back and say, this is not logical or this is badly written. They just wouldn't respond. You'd be completely ignored. So in its own way, it's more effective than the Gulag. Right? They don't have to lock you up. They just ignore you. you know? And I think this is the fate of a lot of people um, certainly in Australia, people who have dissenting opinions. I mean, we're not crazy. We have some experience. We have some knowledge. We're not pretending to know the truth. We just have something to contribute to the pool of knowledge. And you find yourself being cut out. You know? And when this goes on for such a long period of time, of course, it gets frustrating. It's frustrating for many reasons. Because I think that the reading and viewing audience is entitled to a better deal than they're getting. They're invited to hear people who've got some experience. And I can think of many others who've got more experience than me, much more experience, particularly in Syria, you know, and they're not invited into the mainstream. In fact, they're kept at a distance because they disrupt the narrative. All right. These are people who spend a lot of time. I mean, I've only been to Syria two or three times. I haven't been there for a long time, but I know people who have been going there regularly over many, many decades. And in Australia, the media quite frankly, is not interested in what they have to say, right? They keep dishing up the same kind of stories. And from here, I can write and I can complain and I can, I can say that that report is biased. You didn't include this information and you might get a reply, but fundamentally they will kind of deflect you. You won't, you won't get in. Yeah. You know, so I, quite frankly, I, I don't see this situation changing. I really don't. I think the situation will have to change on the ground in the Middle East and it will have to be changed by Middle Eastern actors. All right. And then perhaps the outside world might change. Um, let me go to the question of Syria. I think Syria, you use Syria as a very good example of showing Western hypocrisy. You talk about um, the woman who was in charge of uh, human rights, uh, you, you talk about the white helmets, you talk about the chemical attacks, you talk about many different things where the, the, the pretension of uh, supporting human rights in Syria, whereas it's just the opposite. Why is Syria a good example of Western hypocrisy? Well, I mean, obviously it's not the only example. Uh, you know, this has been going on, as I said, all my adult life. You know, so if we just look in the last 20 years, we have other examples before us. We have the example of Iraq, which is, of course, outstanding as an example of complete mendacity and lies told by the Western governments and accepted by the media. 
if we if we think about Iraq, it was very obvious at the start that what they were saying about chemicals, uh, weapons of mass destruction could not be substantiated. Right? They were false accusations. And this was obvious. I mean, if you were a journalist, if you're trained to look into what you've been told, you could see they had no basis. No basis. So, so why was it the mainstream media, without exception, bought this? Why did they buy it? And then you think, okay, that's a really bad example of propaganda, but it's maybe an aberration. But then we move on to Libya. They do exactly the same thing again. They, they repeat the lies that are being told about Gaddafi um, bombing his own people and all the rest of the stuff that you will be very familiar with. And then we move on to Syria. And it's the same thing again. So there's a repetition here. There's obviously a kind of a conscious desire or a will to tell a certain narrative and, what it, what it, and, and to ignore the contrary facts. I mean, we were told about Syria, as you'll know, that when this so-called uprising began in Dara, that it was the Syrian military that began it all, it shot into unarmed demonstrators, blah, 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 blah. And we know from the start that in Dara, the armed men were ready to go, right? They were ready to go. And so soldiers and police were being killed from the first week. Right? This was never reported in the mainstream. And when we bring this up to date and we go to what was happening at Duma and those extraordinary tunnels, tunnels that were built under the city, extraordinary, extraordinary network of most sophisticated engineering works. Who did this? The Western media simply was not interested, simply did not ask the questions. It didn't ask the questions about the chemical weapons attack in, uh, in Ghouta in 2013. There were apparently a large number of children who were killed. Let me ask you about your, uh, your, your Turkish students. Now, Turkey is an important country in this area. Uh, how do they respond to a person like yourself who is, in a sense, a whistleblower of what's going on in the West? What's the reception? What are you offering them that they might not know? Um, well, as you will know, a lot of the Turkish media is completely co-opted, right? It, it pumps out the official government line of which I've been very critical from the beginning. You know, so I was teaching the Middle East at my university. And of course, there's never any pressure on me. I was always free to say what I wanted. But I think for a lot of the students, it was probably an eye opener. And I'm not sure that all of them actually welcomed it. You know, when I was coming up with my understanding of what was going on in Syria, which was at quite a distance from what they were reading in their media. But of course, the good students, and they're always good students, you know, they appreciate it, they like it, you know, and they will do the testing for themselves, you know, is what he's saying correct, all right? So, uh, yeah, I think it was good for them, good for them to have this alternative voice, yeah. How strong is the networking of people like yourself, uh, academics, uh, whistleblowers, illuminators, uh, worldwide? I mean, from the West, there's an increasing number, especially after 9-11, especially after false attack on Iraq. There's an increasing number in the US and also in Europe and also from, from your side, Australia. Uh, how well do you guys in, network with each other? Uh, no, no, I'm not a networker. I'm not. I'm a, I, I work much by myself. I, I know people who do network quite well and who are very good at social media, um, but I don't do it. But I think that the social media network is now globally quite extensive. And I think, unfortunately, for the mainstream media, I think they've lost a lot of ground because people have more opportunity than they ever had before to look at alternative facts, alternative accounts, alternative narratives, and, and match those up with what they're being told. And people, generally speaking, are not stupid. They're not stupid. You know, they, they can tell when they're being... So I, I think that the media is shooting itself in the foot by what it's doing, you know. And I think, I mean, the, you know, I mean, who reads newspapers these days? Really, uh, newspaper circulation around the world is really, really slumped. I'm not even sure that these I don't know how many people watch television. You know, social media is the big thing. Yeah. Let me go to the point of Iran. Um, from where you're sitting and from where you're studying. 
um, you, you see the, the present U.S. administration uh, having a very definite uh, aims towards Iran, which is, and sometimes it's schizophrenic. They, they play the good cop, bad cop. Uh, they threaten Iran and then they, they ask for a dialogue. How do you say it? How, how, do you, how do you evaluate this and what kind of future do you see with uh, the way the foreign policy is playing with Trump uh, towards Iran? Well, if you actually look at this in a fairly rational fashion, what is America's problem with Iran? Right? Ever since uh, Rafsanjani's time, Iran has made many, many offers to the US, you know, economically and politically. Every single one has been dismissed or ignored or rejected. And I think this kind of reached uh, in the Khatami years, right? He was exactly what they wanted, what they said they wanted. He was extremely moderate, very civilized, decent person, as far as I can tell, right? And willing to go the, the, the further yard to, to reach the progression of America. But they effectively slapped him in the face, right? There's something very strange about this because when you think of it, what is the problem here? Because Iran is a fairly conservative country. It's a God-fearing country, just like America, right? It's got a lot to offer the United States. It's got its own economic output, its oil. It's a road into Central Asia. It, it's a bridge it can use, that America can use to build relationships with other blocs and other countries. So what is the problem? We know what the problem is. The problem is Israel, right? Israel. Israel is like, is like a cork in, in the American foreign policy bottle. Nothing can get out. And it influences America's thinking in everything across the region, from the Gulf, from naturally the relationship with Iran, to Lebanon, to Palestine, to Iraq. Right? It's Israel at the bottom of all this. I'm not speaking in any conspiratorial way. But the importance of Israel in for American foreign policy determination is not to be understated at all, right? Now, if you take Israel, if you could imagine Israel out of the equation, what would the problem be? Right, there'd be a problem between Saudi Arabia, which is somewhat psychotic about Iran, and always has been, or has been as long as I can remember. But that, if you take Israel out of the equation, yeah, yeah, what what would the real problem be for America? Right? It's Israel, right? Because Iran supports all the people and all the causes that that stand up to Israel. Israel it, Iran fundamentally is the center of an axis of resistance in the Middle East, right? And Israel wants the ground to be cleared, and this is kind of problem, right? Which is Iran and the strategic alliance it has with Syria, Hezbollah, right? So right. the Americans think pushing pushing against an immovable object all the time. Israel seems to think it can reshape the Middle East in its own interests. Right? This whole Middle East, all its history, all its culture, all its thousands of years of existence, that are, Israel it thinks, seems to think it can bend the Middle East to do what it wants. Well, this is not going to work. And the Americans don't seem to realize this. Like if we take uh, Iraq as an example, uh, when they invaded Iraq in 2003, and devastated country, rewrote the constitution and talked about bringing democracy to Iraq. Oh, what a good idea. You do realize, don't you, that the majority of the population is Shia Muslim, right? And the Shia Muslims of Iraq, although they've got their own independent life, they've got ties with Iran and southern Lebanon going back centuries. Family ties, religious ties, religious ties, ties of all kinds. And you think, really think you're going to break that? Right? I, you know, the logic behind what they did is hard to, very, very hard to see. Of course, and now they've got problems with, 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 with Iraq. Iraq hasn't worked out for them. They tried to set up the northern Kurdish region as, I think, a strategic base of operation. That folded like two years ago when Barzani pulled on the referendum. Right? And the people said yes to independence, and and the Iraqi government and Turkey and Iran shut them off. Right. So this is a a blow to America and a blow to Israel. So there's a fundamental kind of um, what is what would you call it? It's a, a failure to see clearly, kind of cognitive dissonance in American foreign policy making. Yeah. Um, 
Is there another point you would like to raise that uh, has been, I've been asking different questions that you'd like to point out a combination of the points I've been bringing up, or a, a point that you think is pertinent to our, to our show? Well, um, well, we could go on and on, right, about the Middle East, right? But if we go back to our original issue, which was the, the deal of the century, right, yes. which I call the joke of the century, which might also be called the worst deal of the century. It is so extraordinary that they could even come up with such a scheme, right? right? That, that the minds in the State Department or whomever, and, and I mean, I know Trump gave this to Jared Kushner, but it's so extraordinary that they could come up with this, this, this awful, um, cheap plan to solve the situation in Palestine, it, take, it really is an insight into the thinking in America. You know, you had to ask, you had to ask a question about how American foreign policy is now being formed by a couple of delinquents, by Jared Kushner and his wife. What? Has he been, is, he's got the central responsibility for resolving the Middle East? I mean, it's beyond satire. It is really beyond satire. What happened to the American um, foreign policy, foreign service of the 1960s and 70s. We might not agree with them, but at least they were and they were rational. Like the, the Dean Musk in Atchison, right? These were sensible people. They were professional, professional people who had the national interest at heart. But look at this. Look at what they're doing now. It's really quite extraordinary. Excellent. Um, and, I'm, and I just uh, was re reminded about a question that I've been always very, I, I've always seeked the, the, the question of Yemen in another show that we do um, and, and um, the role of the U.S. Saudi Emirates in um, decimating Yemen uh, in broad daylight uh, and you've brought it up in one of your articles also. I mean anyone with any clear conscience would talk about Yemen and also Yemen is really changing the scene. They're, they've been victorious in south of uh, Saudi Arabia, despite everything that they lack. Many think that Yemen is going to be a game changer. What do you think about that? Well, this is quite, the whole situation is extraordinary. I mean, this is uh, Mohammed bin Salman's policy. Everyone knows that. This is his idea, one of his uh, many unsuccessful ideas. All right. And the Saudis, a bit like Anwar Sadat back in 1962, when the Egyptians went into Egypt, and he said at that time, oh, this will be a picnic by the Red Sea. Right? We'll be in and out of there in a few weeks. And five years later, they were stuck and had to withdraw because of the 67 war. And this is what the Saudis were saying. Well, we'll fix this. This will be quick. Now they're stuck. And the Yemenis, the Houthis, are quite extraordinary. See these... These young men, you know, kind of clambering, running up hills and, and kind of they're sharpshooters. Uh, they've taken the war across the border into Saudi Arabia and the Saudis are suffering. And I don't think they can get out of it. They don't know how. But the thing for me is the attitude of the Western governments. They had this murder, this shocking murder in Istanbul, right? A, you know, a, a pretty gruesome event. And yet they continue to sell weapons. To Saudi Arabia. It's their weapons, American weapons and British weapons, that are killing the Yemenis by the thousands, killing children and reducing the whole country to a genus to the level of genocide. And they don't stop. So there's definitely something amiss here. It's not me. I don't think it's me or other people who are criticizing. It's you. You you know you need to recalibrate what you're doing because it's not moral, it's not legal. Right? You might think it's successful politically because who can stop it is but it's truly really disgusting you know and we know that even in america that the u.s senate has tried to pass has passed votes against arming saudis it's been blocked in the white house because trump wants to do business as usual right and that includes overlooking the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul. It's, 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 it's terrible. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Where are the principles? <laughs> Where's yes. the morality? Where's the legality? Where's the compassion? Where's the, I mean, how can you do this? How can a human being 
right, with a normal sense of compassion, a normal heart, look at what's going on in Yemen and actually not just allow it to continue, but to make sure it continues. Uh, you know, it, what, what can we say about this, really? Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, I, I thank you for, for speaking with us. But I, all the way through the, the interview, I was thinking it would have been so much nicer if we had you in person in Tehran, yes. yeah. Where, uh, yeah. where your face would not break up or your voice would not break up because you'd be here in presence. And um, I, I, I couldn't uh, get over the fact that uh, you're not that far away. I mean, you're, you're not that far no, away. No, I haven't, been to, I haven't been to Iran. Of course, I'd love to come. So maybe one day I could come. Yeah, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. There are many, many questions that I have in mind, but I'll let them rest because we'll get this program uh, edited and uh, then we can talk about further things and maybe further plans to have a, uh, a better sitting uh, with, a, with better right. reception. Every time uh, I'm, I'm really taken back by the, uh, the knowledge of guests such as you, and also, you've been below the radar. I, I, I'm sorry I missed you all these years, uh, but I'm very happy that we have you on this show right now, and uh, hope to mm -hmm. have yes, we hope to have another uh, interview in person. We'll work that out sometimes. Okay, no, no, nice to meet you. Take nice care. To be on the Take, show. Show. Take care. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay, thank you very much for watching the program. I hope you've enjoyed it. See you next week.